Okay, so Bodo Elmers, you've come to Finland to talk about more effective aid. So is, is development aid not working or why should it be more effective? How should it be more effective? Well, development aid is working but not as good as it could or as it is not as effective as it could be. There are many reasons for that. I mean, aid is still to a large extent donor driven. Choices are not made by the recipients, not by the recipient countries, but especially not by the well, let's say the intended beneficiaries by poor people, vulnerable people in developing countries. And another reason why aid is not effective enough is that much aid never receives, never reaches the developing countries. Much aid never enters their economy. This is a consequence of the procurement practices of donor countries. Most of the money, most of the aid funded contracts go to northern firms. So, um, well, two solutions to tackle these problems is to strengthen democratic ownership of, developing, of development cooperation and also well, to move towards local procurement in developing countries. Right. And you're going to talk about these things with the whole world in Busan in, in no, end of this month. What is, what is the meeting in Busan about? Well, Busan is now the fourth high level form in aid effectiveness. It follows a series of previous forms where we, in Paris and Accra, where we agreed on the Paris Declaration and the Accra Agenda for Action. One of the aims um, of Busan is to look back at what we have achieved so far and to address the unfinished business. Unfinished business is in particular implementation. Implementation did not make much progress, so we have very comprehensive agreements, but in practice they haven't been implemented. We received the, the so-called evidence, the Paris Monitoring Survey recently, and we found that well, only one of the 13 targets agreed in Paris, and which were supposed to be met by 2010, have actually been met. But the second dimension for Busan is to look beyond and to move from aid effectiveness to a wider agenda, development effectiveness. This um, development effectiveness concept, I mean, for us as human rights, uh, for us as NGOs, it means um, moving towards human rights-based approaches and in development cooperation. There are different concepts, however, um, for some people, and this is how it is mainly dealt with now in the official Busan agenda. Development effectiveness means to have as many actors as possible in, in one agreement. This may include new providers of development finance, South-South cooperation, countries such as China, India, but also the private sector, and to make sure that um, all these actors agree on a joint, well, on joint principles for, for development effectiveness, basically. What would be a good end result of Busan? What would be a win for Eurodad and civil society? Well, let's put it that way. We were very optimistic in the beginning when we relaunched our advocacy after Accra. So we came with a very, well, it means very ambitious, I wouldn't say it's ambitious, it's to think, well, what do you have to do, basically, to make aid effectiveness? We came with a key us paper of demands um, dealing with both sides, the aid effectiveness agenda and the development effectiveness agenda. We followed the um, negotiations in Paris quite closely over the past three years. It is a bit frustrating, I must say. There is not much consensus on key issues, especially um, there's lots of narrative now, but there are no concrete time-bound commitments. Yeah. So the first thing we need is really um, concrete time-bound commitments, because otherwise nothing will happen after Busan. And secondly, I mean, there were in the latest draft we saw there were at least there was the agreement to untie all aid by 2015, and there was some language on democratic ownership. So, as a minimal line or as a red line, we would say if we have this agreement by all donors to untie all aid by 2015 to move towards more local procurement, this would be a success. And if we have the concept of democratic ownership acknowledged throughout the declaration and also operationalized, I mean not just as a buzzword, but um, as a, in, in a really operationalized manner for the whole cycle of development cooperation, for programming, for implementation, that would be, I think, would be a success. Building on that, uh, critics such as William East Easterly from the New York University <clears throat> have said that these kind of high-level fora are more a talk about talk and nothing really gets, gets much done, as you say, that implement, implementation is lacking. Do you agree? Should there be more real action in countries, such capitals such as Finland, Finland, Helsinki, or...? Definitely. Uh, well, I would say both. I mean, these high-level forms, these conferences are important because they are, well, they raise a lot of awareness, media awareness, political awareness. That's one of the only moments that really ministers deal with these issues. So you need these events because 
um, well, between these forums is usually the bureaucrats um, who who deal with the issues and they don't have the power to make the decisive, to make the important decisions. So this makes these high level forums important, but critics are right that we have many, many international conferences and between these conferences not much happens. And mm. what we do not need is more text in international declarations. We need really implementation, we need real change. And this change has to be done well, by governments, by aid agencies, so this really implies to have a continuous engagement and a continuous reform process in, in capitals, in aid agency headquarters, and also of course in the way how, how aid agencies or also development, co development country governments operate on the ground, so both is equally important. Yeah, and ironically it's, it seems that the, the southern countries, the recipients, have actually enhanced, made aid much better, much, much, much better progress than us in the donor countries. Yeah. Well, the reason is probably, I mean, the reason is the way how development cooperation works. Um, donors can sanction developing countries by, or can even create incentives. I mean, they can provide more aid for, for countries that behave well, how they put it, or they can cut aid for countries that do not behave in the way donors want them to do or that do not stick to the agreements made. So there are clear sanction mechanisms from the donor side to the recipient side. And this has obviously triggered some reform processes in developing countries. Yeah. On the other hand, um, recipients have no chance to impose sanctions on donors. Well, they could throw them out of the country, but most of them still are still key to receive the money, to receive the aid. So this is why there was not much pressure on donors to reform. And the few processes we had, I mean, the European Union, for instance, has, for instance, has developed an operational framework for for aid effectiveness to drive implementation throughout the European Union. But it was not very effective, it was also not very well monitored. And yeah, at the moment, I mean, development cooperation is a pretty chaotic and anarchic field of, you could say, of international relations. It is not compared to trade, for instance. Trade, the WTO mm -hmm. rules are basically, this is hard law. And there are sanction mechanisms in place. When you violate them, you have to pay money. Yeah. We don't have such things in development cooperation. This is why it's very difficult to sanction non-compliance of donor countries, especially in this environment we have, where there are massive power imbalances between the north and the south. And the result is, well, you can see the results very clearly. Um, developing countries made more progress in sticking to and complying with an international agreement to which both sides agreed than the donor country side. Yeah.